There we go. Okay, folks, so we're going to get started. Uh, so the uh, first topic today is going to be uh, basics of causal diagrams. Um, so causal loop diagrams, where do they fit in in the, um, that modeling process we looked at? Can anyone tell me? Where do causal loop diagrams fit? Sort of on the left side or the right side? More qualitative or more quantitative? Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The left hand side. Yeah. The <laughs> okay. So so I, I'm asking you here, there's a there's a model that I provided you in the examples folder called infectious disease causal loops only with multi-layer hidden components. Um that's a long that's a long name. You know you know who created that, right? Um <laughs> Okay, so so I'd like you to open that. That's in the examples area. Um, okay, so we go to tutorials and we go into SD and examples. Um, and these should be in, oh, um, oh gosh. Um, I don't have it here, sorry. It must be my other folder here. Um, the, okay, this, this should have been in there, but um, so they're called infect. There it is, infectious disease causal loops. It's in additional models. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I guess. Okay. So so um. What I've done, I've just asked you to go into Venison and open this, and I, I need to talk a little bit about Venison. We're going to be using Venison all throughout this course um, as our tool. And Venison has many capabilities. Only We're going to only touch on a small fraction of those. And in this causal diagram components, subset of those yet. But we can use Venison to build simulation models we can also use it to build causal loop diagrams. And what stands before you is a causal loop diagram uh, with, that, that illustrates linkages between a number of factors that relate to the spread of infection in the population. So what you see is individual items called variables here um, that, that have words associated with them. And these are linked. These are linked by arrows. And those arrows are further labeled with what's called a polarity, indicating whether it's a minus or a plus. And we're going to explain what these mean in just a moment. But it relates to the causal relationship between them. And it has to do with the relative ways in which uh, one affects the other. So if A has an arrow to B, going to B, means that change in A can influence, causally influence, the change in B. Now, so we have labeled these little, uh, these little linkages, but we've also labeled these, these loops. So it turns out that I mentioned that one of system dynamics hallmark distinctions is its focus on feedbacks. Feedbacks are shaping behavior. Feedbacks can lead a system to be very stable and resistant to change. So when I push down this desk, it pushes back at me. When I ding this thing, it, it bounces back. But I can, <laughs> not to make too fine a point of it, uh, but it can also lead to a system to be quite prone to change. Where, you know, you release something and releasing it on one side leads to one effect, releasing on the other side to another effect altogether. Okay? Um, it can lead to change that's faster and faster, that snowballs. And we'll see each of these types of cause a loop, it's labeled by polarity, a positive feedback and a negative feedback, or balancing feedback. Um, so reinforcing or positive, balancing or negative. These are types of, of loops, and, and they have characteristic behaviors with them. 
These behaviors include very fast acceleration, includes great stability, includes oscillations, okay? Okay, so we have this in Vensim, and this is a causal loop diagram built in Vensim, and we're going to, to uh, see, see how that's done a little bit, but suffice it to say that within Vensim, we can, we can build these causal loop diagrams, and when we do view here, we can actually show increasing amounts. So that's a little causal loop diagram, and if we, we can say show hidden, and show additional layers. It's like an onion, and we can add in things to this onion. So I'm showing layer one only, I guess. But let's look at layer two. Ooh. We start to add factors in. Layer three. Mm. And in fact, if you use, I think if you use the up and down keys, you could start adding things in. Up key reduces things, hides things. Down key shows things, okay? So this will, this will allow us to expand a causal loop diagram. So what you could see here, what you can appreciate, I believe, visually, is that these diagrams can become very rich, quite large, quite extensive, and can describe the relationship between lots of components of variables. So we're going we're gonna to try to take a look at how we build up these diagrams in this, in this lecture. What, what do they represent? What do they show? Let's just spend a moment in Fensim to see how we do this. Okay, so we're going to go file. You're going to build your very first model. It's going to be a causal loop diagram. It's a qualitative model, uh, fine model. Um, so you go to font, file, new model. And it's going to ask you something, and you're not going to know what that is, and you're not going to worry about it right now. Okay? Just press OK. Um, okay, and it, pre it presents you with a clear canvas on which you'll be able to draw. So, how do we draw a causal loop diagram? See this guy up here? It says variable, auxiliary constant. You could just click on that and then click on the canvas. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to put down, I'm going to type births, okay? So that's one variable. And then I'm going to put another variable over here doing the same thing. I'm in this mode. When I clicked on it, it got into that variable mode. What that means, I can click around and it will stay in that mode. It will add a variable each time I click. Yeah? Okay, so I click once, I did burst. I click again and I'm going to type population. Yeah? See that? Okay. Now I'm going to link them together. And for that, I use this little arrow up here on the left. Again, I'm getting into arrow mode. OK? <coughs> I, and now I, I want to draw an arrow. I need to draw an arrow. It's a relational entity, as a side could appreciate. <coughs> it links two things. How do I indicate what it links up? Well, I click on the thing it could, should come from to wit births. And I click on the thing to which it should fly, population. Um, so, so now I've drawn that link. So it's going from there to there. Now, if I wish to label it, well, maybe we'll do that later. We're going to wait. But that's the basic gist of, of how we draw that. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to this, this thing here. And we're going to talk about causal loop diagrams. And maybe we'll elaborate that one just a little bit, okay, while we're, while we're doing this. Okay, so... Causal diagrams focus on cap capturing causality of a system in a qualitative fashion, particularly feedback effects. Okay? Now, when drawing these diagrams, we link up variables. A links to B. And it's out of those links that broader structures like feedbacks are assembled. Um, so A links to B. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a polarity associated with that link. Polarity indicates the causal impact, how, how a change in this guy affects a change in that guy. If you increase the food ingested, does hunger, all other things being equal, keeping all other things equal, would hunger go, become greater or less? If you ingest food, will your hunger decrease or increase? If it's going to increase, it will be a plus. If it's going to be decreasing, it will be a minus. Okay? So if I increase food ingested, will hunger decrease or increase? Who can speak? David, hold your tongue. 
No wise crap. <laughs> well, will it increase or decrease? It will decrease. If I eat, normally I become less hungry. I assume that's a common phenomenon. Um, so it's a, it's a minus sign, yeah? Okay, so, so we can formulate this, if, if for those who are mathematically inclined, um, can be formulated as a partial derivative. The change in y, given a little positive change in x, it, it, sort of that divided by that is is less than zero. So there are opposite signs. If we change x, we have a small increment in x, it will actually lead to a decrease in y for, for this line. So if we increase this, all of the things being equal, hunger will go down. If I had a plus, if we increase that, all the things being equal, that would increase, okay? So I provide the definitions here. And again, I want to emphasize it's against what it otherwise would have been. All of the things being equal, this will increase or decrease compared to what it would have been otherwise. Hmm? Not increase or decrease, like, does it go up or down over time? It's compared to what it would have been if I hadn't made that change. Okay? Um, Okay, so I would reason about each link in isolation. Think about A to B, say if A increases, does B increase or decrease compared to what it otherwise would have been? Um, and it's very helpful to, to always sort of focus on, on the increase case. Now that doesn't mean that all changes will be in the positive direction, but it helps you reason through the issues, okay? Um, okay, so let's go back to our diagram here. Let's go back there, and let's add a polarity. So, if births increase, all of the things being equal, would population increase or decrease compared to what it would have been? Will it tend to increase the population or decrease compared to what it could have been? If we have babies born. Yeah, population increase. Okay, good. So we're going to go here, and you'll notice that uh, because I'm still in this mode, what's that? I said it's going to increase. Yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, that's a little slow. <laughs> yeah, um. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. So, so let's right click on this guy, this link here. So, okay. So we're still in this mode, arrow mode. See that? That's why that's depressed. And then we right click on this guy, and we are going to click on the plus here. And we can actually choose where that plus occurs. Does it occur near the arrowhead or at the handle? My own preference is to put it near the handle. That is, is it occurring kind of, oh, it's, it's not a very good uh, place to look at it, but is it occurring sort of here or is it occurring up here? And my, my preference is to put, do it at the handle. So, so we're gonna put it at the handle, plus, watch that. Okay, okay. I think it should be a plus, right? Bursts increase. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's actually a. Okay, <laughs> folks, on my screen, it is very clearly a plus. Let me see if I can. Uh, what? Why are the. What the? Can you change the color? Okay, that's. Yeah, I'll change the color. It's a good idea. That is bizarre. Because, I mean, it, it, it stands in front of me. Anyone come on up here. Yeah, um, yeah. Can, see it. can you see it? That's very tough. Can you just <laughs> That that is uh, disturbing. Um, here, let's let's try changing its color. Oh. Okay. It seems to me that this projector has had issues like that previously, or like this sort of projector screen combo has had issues where on your monitor it's showing one. Okay, maybe I need to change resolutions. Um, but uh, that's, that's, let me just see if I make it a bigger font or something. Um, yeah, yeah, there we go, okay. Okay, okay, that's disturbing. Um, okay, um, so, so we have a plus. Yeah. 
Okay, so we have a we have a plus there. Um, and we can notice we could drag this arrow around um, <coughs> as we see fit, and it, it knows. Or we could drag these things around, right? And it it'll keep them connected. So it's not like we have to reconnect the arrow every time we we drag population around. Okay, so we have our polarity associated with that. Um, now, often we don't just have two variables. We have a sequence of variables, a chain of them, actually. Two, three, four, etc. And we'll have a, a whole pathway. Now, turns out the way the mathematics of this work, let's suppose I, I have a relationship between A and B that is a negative link associated with that. What that means is if I increase A, holding everything else equal, it will tend to decrease B compared to what it otherwise would have been, right? And suppose I have a link between B and C that's also got a negative polarity associated with it. We could correspondingly define that. If I increase A, how would that tend to increase, how would that tend to change C compared to what it otherwise would have been? Would it go in the same direction? Would it tend to increase or decrease? It would be in the same direction. So let's think about this a little bit. So, so what this minus sign would mean is that um, um, that's not, you know, doesn't, it works for me, not for you. Um, okay, um, so, so this guy here, if I were to increase A, it'll tend to decrease B compared to what it would have been. If I decrease A, it would increase B compared to what it otherwise would have been. In other words, they're going in, they're influencing, this is, the change here leads to an opposite direction change here compared to what it would have been. And the same thing here. So if I were to increase A, it'll tend to decrease B compared to what it would have been. And that decrease of B would tend to increase C compared to what it would have been. And so an increase here will cause an increase here, okay? Um, and in general, if we have pairs of these things, they cancel. It's kind of like in grade school arithmetic, you learned a, I think it was grade school, you learned a minus times a minus yielded a plus. You had a minus one times a minus two gave a plus two. Remember that? Um, yeah, okay. So, so when we have these things, we can, we can reason about them that way. Um, okay, so we don't have time to go into some of the, uh, the details here, but suffice it to say, when you build these diagrams, you're sometimes confronted by the fact that you have an A and a B, and it sort of seems like sometimes it's one and sometimes it's the other polarity. Right? Um, so sometimes working longer hours makes you more productive, but sometimes working longer hours makes you more fatigued, and you make more mistakes, and you're actually less productive. So how to deal with these sort of situations? Well. What we'll often do is we'll try to break out different causal pathways, different ways in which they can influence each other, okay? Now, we do this for sort of two reasons, kind of how, I, how I think about it. One of these reasons is we want to document the different ways they influence each other. You know, if we, we just showed two arrows, one for the plus, one for the minus. Someone will look at that and they'll say, well, what was, what was he thinking, right? But if you, if you actually draw up the pathways and the, and the links between them, um, you could document it. Here, for example, food intake. You take in more food. It turns out that you take calories in and, and you can increase your energy surplus because of that. But there's actually some ways in which you take in food and it can increase your metabolism and it can lead to more calories being burned. And that will tend to decrease the energy surplus. Now, that doesn't mean that this, the impact of this cause pathway cancels this out entirely. It's just that this one increases energy surplus. This tends to decrease it compared to what it would have been otherwise. And the net in, it's actually a net increase, as one happens to know. But the point is, these are two different pathways that are illustrated. So if we have a variable, um, like overtime, that's linked to this other variable, work accomplished today, 
Well, often, we'll often want to diagram it with two, with several different pathways. So one reason is to make it comprehensible. Another reason is that we'd like it to be unambiguous from the point of view of um, of, of the uh, plus or, or minus connections. And often by, by disaggregating in this way, we can do this. We can associate the linkages here with clear polarities, okay? So, so I'll often diagram these things out. So here we have overtime. Overtime could lead after some delay, and we'll sometimes show delays in this sort of di sort of marker to some fatigue. Fatigue will tend to decrease efficiency, and efficiency ends up a comp ends up affecting work accomplished per day. If we increase this, this would increase compared to what it otherwise would have been. So yeah, um, we could draw that in. The other hand, and it also leads to incorporation of tasks outside of work, which also decreases efficiency. But it also leads to more time working, which can lead to more work accomplished per day. So this is an illustration of sort of how you can unpack an ambiguous link between A and B into a set of smaller links, okay? Uh, the set of pathways. Okay. Um, okay, so let's just quickly go through feedback loops. So we talked about variables and the links between variables, and now we need to, as they say, close the loop. We need to complete our thinking about this. And one of the things you realize is if you start getting these connections, you can, in fact, start getting loops between things. Even this thing that we looked at earlier, overtime and work accomplished per day. Surely overtime affects work accomplished per day. Does work accomplished per day, do you, you think there's a chance it might affect how much overtime you work? Yeah. If we're not being very productive per day, you might be more tempted to do work overtime. And so there's actually a loop back here that we could draw, Ca uh, cause a loop, uh, a, um, a feedback, okay? So loops in these diagrams indicate feedbacks. <coughs> what does that mean? Well, it would mean in that feedback, be it reinforcing or balancing, which we'll get into, a change to one of those variables will lead to a rippling through of changes across that loop that will either reinforce, either amplify that original change, or it will push back against it. Help try to keep it in check. Help try to balance it out. And how do we know which it is? We use the product of signs rule. Now it's also good to think it through carefully. But but just as we can reason about the linkage associated with a pathway, A, B, B to C, that is a certain direction. We can also reason about the linkage of a pathway that happens to form a loop. Okay? Okay, so let's, let's go draw a loop. My first loop. Okay? Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it, I'm going to drag this so that it's up, way up there, okay? This is going to be a big loop. Okay, um, so we're going to complete this pathway. So can anyone argue that there might be a link between the population and births? <coughs> okay, what sort of link might it be? If, if we have more population, all of the things being equal, will it tend to lead to more births or fewer births? <coughs> Sorry? More. Okay, so let's draw... Should I, should I no. You speak away. No, you, you, I, 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 I delighted to, I hear your voice and I rejoice. Um, okay, so, so let's, let's draw an arrow. Did you see how I did that? I'm going to show you how to use the pack. This, this guy is your friend, but he's a friend you have to be careful about. I'm going to show how you can delete things. See this guy, the Pac-Man? So if you go and you click near the arrowhead, be careful. But click it. He'll he'll eat the arrow. Okay. So I'm going to show you again. I draw it with an arrow. I'm in arrow mode, and I click on population. And I click on bursts, and then I can draw this round. And then I can put a a little um, plus in. I can put it this and put it on the handle, 
Now, probably because of the problem we had earlier with the re screen resolution, I'll make this a nice big plus. Okay, there we go, right? Okay, the, 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 ignore the colors. It's, that's not important. Um, maybe I, sh I should make it the same color, just to avoid distracting people. We'll make it black. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a loop. What sort of loop is this? Um, okay, so it's a reinforcing loop. And we know that because when we consider it as a pathway, a change in birth, let's just stick this in through. Change in birth, an increase in birth, all of the things being equal would increase population compared to what it otherwise would have been. Mm -hmm. Keeping constant for a moment, thoughts about deaths and so on. And an increase in population will lead all the things being equal to an increase in births. That doesn't mean it's instantly going to explode, but eventually it's going to lead to an increase in births, yeah? Um, so uh, change here, or maybe more to the point, a change here even, if you were to increase the population um, uh, coming into Saskatoon, uh, the whole community of people come, say 100 people come in, it'll lead to more births and to an even greater population in the future. Sort of magnify that change over time. Okay, how do we indicate that? We put in a comment. See up here? You got a comment. This is the comment. And we're gonna, we're gonna click in the middle of this guy here. And see that? It gives us this whole set of choices. And what we do is we select image, we can do a plus, and we'll do loop clockwise, because it's a clockwise loop. The arrows are going in a clockwise direction. See that? Okay? Okay, so that's our first loop. Um, so it's a causal loop, and it's a positive loop. What does a positive loop really mean? Okay, let's get into this. Okay, so these feedbacks are associated, are several different types. I mean, the, two, the big, most critical distinction is a balancing feedback, where the original change leads to a cascading series of changes that push back against that original change. I, st I feel hunger, I go and I get food, I eat and I decrease that hunger. An increase in my hunger will lead to this cascading series of actions that push back against it. I fill my stomach with a sandwich. Or a bowel slip. Um, so, the other type of loop is a reinforcing loop. And that original change there ripples around the loop and amplifies itself. It even increases it more. That original change, the, the difference compared to what it would have been, it gets amplified more. And we have these things in space, both both of these. So um, people have, have pointed to, to weight change, <laughs> positive feedbacks associated with weight change in the population. Um, people's perception of normal ranges of weight go up. And the target weights go up, and the mean weight of the population um, follows. So, <coughs> so we have a sort of a, uh, a positive feedback there. This is something the companies aim for, right? The more customers you get, the more satisfied customers you get, the more they tell their friends about the product, about how good the iPad is, or how good a pocketbook it is, or whatever. And and then more people go out and buy it. So they're hoping for that sort of thing. To, to have people who see a movie say how good a movie it is, and they get their friends to see it, and you get this spot of the snowballing effect. It goes viral. They send the messages around, you gotta see this. And more and more people see it, right? Number of infectives goes up, number of new infections goes up, and that drives up the number of new infectives quickly. <coughs> So you get a rapid acceleration there. That doesn't mean it goes on forever. We'll see different loops start to interact and limit this. 
But these are, that might be called a vicious cycle, right? Um, vicious cycles associated with uh, spread of illnesses and so on. Others of these might be called virtuous cycles. These customers of word of mouth sales, et cetera. Now, they're, in contrast to those virtuous and vicious cycles, these are things that are very unstable. Positive feedbacks or reinforcing loops are unstable. They snowball. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. Worse and worse and worse. They're better and better and better. You have Google growing very, very quickly. You get a popular site on the internet, people start to put links to it in their pages. Google ranks it higher when you do a search, so people are more likely to discover your site on Google because it's higher up there in the listings. And even more people put links to your site. The rich get richer. Poor sometimes get poorer. So you get this amplification with a positive feedback. That positive doesn't mean it's good. It means that that original change is amplified. Amplified. But there's also negative feedback loops. I gave the example earlier. What example did I give earlier? It involved hunger. hunger. Thank you. And in fact, our body, it reflects the fact that our body has a huge homeostatic mechanism you know, in place. So our body has lots and lots of these negative feedbacks to restore balance. Give me another one besides hunger, another obvious one. I see it even in the mugs in this room. <laughs> so you're tired and you get coffee? Yeah, so okay, that's one of them. Um, but you're thirsty and you, you want to drink the water, it will lessen your thirst, it will slake your thirst, right? So, so these, so our body has these mechanisms, it has mechanisms for, for uh, salt. I eat too much salt. Doesn't permanently knock me out of bounds. My body has ways of restoring it. I eat, too, I eat a lot of sugar, and and my body has ways of restoring balance. It, it secretes insulin and so on. And it helps bring down sugar levels. Um, case after case, the body has ways of of healing itself, of bringing it back into equilibrium. And negative feedback loops are all about equilibrium. They're about change getting damped out over time to bring it back to some equilibrium, okay? We see these all around. Hunger is one of them. Mistakes. Hopefully, we learn from our mistakes and that lessens our making mistakes in the future. If this loop is cut, it's a big problem. But if the loop is going on, sure, we'll make mistakes, but we're quick to admit them and quick to correct them. And we can bring ourselves quickly back into line with what we need to do. New infections go up and surely accelerate, but they also deplete the susceptibles. They deplete the fuel for the fire. The fire spreads, fuel starts getting used up, and it limits how far the fire can spread. Okay? Um, even at a policy level, we hope that this sort of loop is operating, that policies that aren't very effective get reevaluated and they get adapted and they improve over time. I know it doesn't always operate, but you hope it happens. And people have risk perception. Perceive risk of illness, chronic or infectious, they take care to avoid it, and it lowers the prevalence. So these are balancing loops. Okay, so positive feedback, reinforcing, unstable, negative feedback loops, stable. Okay. Um, now, we can, we can link up these loops. These loops don't operate in isolation, spinning off in fragmented ways. They're, they're linked together. That's why we're talking about this in the systems modeling context. Okay? So we can link them together. We have competing loops. When it comes to infectious diseases, we have these loops competing. Rapid increases in the number of infectives early on, but then we're also depleting the susceptibles. And eventually this loop catches up with this one and pulls it pulls it back to a new equilibrium. 
you know, we have, may have increases in obesity for certain reasons, but that also leads to, you know, study of ways to decrease that burden, et cetera, right? Um, okay. Um, so, you know, we can elaborate these, um, start adding in additional feedbacks, and in fact, that system that we were looking at earlier can start to take into account additional factors. So, you know, we might start with a very basic understanding of the situation, uh, illustrated qualitatively. You know, infection susceptibles and contacts. So here, contacts between susceptibles and infectives, if those are increased, we get an increase in the number of new infections. That increases the number of infectives who can spread the infection, and we get more contacts between susceptibles and, and infectives, say, per month. But it all these new infections also decrease the number of susceptibles. So each additional person we infect is one person less we can infect in the future. Okay? But we might want to add components into this. For example, represent recoveries in an immune population. In an immune population which you know builds up over time and but which eventually through waning of immunity goes back to susceptibles. But it can lead to additional um, components. So now, that was that component. Um, you know, we may have infectives who present for treatment and we get diagnosed infectives which are then treated and become recovered individuals. And it also, these diagnosed infectives, the fact that we're diagnosing infectives leads to public perceptions of risk which can lead to social distancing as people take care to avoid the flu or to avoid um, avoid the sexually transmitted infection and attention to hygiene. So people mix less or they're more careful, use prophylactic measures, and that can decrease the likelihood of transmission. So we can take these loops and we can start adding factors in. Now, it, diagrams like this um, you can readily add to them. Um, suffice it to say that while we don't have time in this class to go into it um, in this session, it turns out building diagrams like this that are clear, transparent, um, is not totally trivial. It requires some thought. Like, how should I name things? Um, is this the variable I really want or should I describe it differently? Do I need to break this single link up into several steps? because it's held in common for many different pathways. Sorry, yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. And which one would you like me to go this uh, way? Or this way. Yeah. Okay. So there's uh, there's actually uh it's not showing up really clearly on the screen, but there's a uh, plus here. So the number of in, as the number of infectives increase, the number of infectives presenting for treatment, all those things being equal, will increase. And as the number of infectives presenting for treatment increase, this is a plus here too. You can kind of see the stubby component. <laughs> that's a that's a stubby. This is this is. This is actually really good to see this uh, diagnosis problem early on. So there's a stubby plus. This is a stubby plus. Um, that's a plus. This is a plus. This is a minus. That's a minus there. Um, yeah, I... Um, Sorry, I was confused. I suspect it's some slight difference in the resolutions. When, in our next break, which will be coming up soon, I'm going to switch it to a different resolution and see if we could avoid this. But, um, I mean, it's really a little bit shocking um, just how, how poor it is. So then are these uh, sessions going to be in here, like the ones yeah, that we have to work for? No. Or are they gonna be They're going to be over at Spanx. Okay. So it might not. It might not, but it would be worth checking ahead of time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe different issues there. Um, but uh, maybe the second session will be over there. Um, okay, so we can keep on adding things in. As I say, doing this well, um, you can actually get an amazingly comprehensive 
you know, understanding of many of the factors that relate and many of the positives and negatives. Um, but you'll find that um, building up one of these diagrams can actually require a fair degree of thinking and sharpening your way of thinking about the system. It forces you to really think through your understanding of how it works. And does that mean that this is correct? No. Again, this is a, a dynamic hypothesis. It's a, it's a representation of one understanding of how the system may work. But again, by diagramming it, I could then show it to any one of you, and you could critique it. Again, you could, maybe if those were negative signs, you could say, does increasing the number of infectives really decrease the number of people getting diagnosed, for example? If that was a true belief of mine, you could challenge it because it's shown in the open. Whereas if I'm just reasoning about it without talking about it or showing it openly, it's hard to find. Okay, so these capture dynamic hypotheses. Um, it makes explicit our assumptions and allows us to critique them. Okay. Um, Okay, now, this is, this is important, and this is the final component of this uh, uh, causal loop session. Each loop in a causal diagram is associated with a dynamic behavior. Fancy words. What I mean is that when you have a loop, it involves certain variables. Those variables, over time, they tend to behave in certain ways. You look at them, they'll increase in a certain way, or they'll decrease, etc. Um, so we can get exponential growth. Have you ever heard a microphone screech? Where you have a microphone and a speaker close together? That's positive feedback in action. There's other positive feedbacks in action. When sometimes when couples fight, you know, um, they, they get sort of love less and less inclined to, to, to give them each other any slack and get more and more critical and each one gets more and more mad at the other and it can sometimes spiral out of control. Fortunately, there's negative feedbacks that bring them back into balance. Um, homeostatic mechanisms. Um, uh, sometimes com countries going to war have sort of an exponential growth escalation for a while, what have you. Arms race, right? Exponential growth. We see this in a lot of areas of life. Instability that drives the takeoff of an epidemic. The spread of news about some new, new uh, technology or, or new fancy gadget. You get this exponential growth in interest. Goal seeking adjustment and then oscillation. Okay, um, so positive feedbacks. This was the example I had earlier. Site popularity and likelihood of cross listing. I have a popular site. It gets people have links to it. It gets listed on Google. Even more people discover it. They put links. It feeds and feeds and feeds. Or customers here. Yeah, and you can get this sort of takeoff. Number of people hearing some rumor. Number of people getting worried about some trend. Um. Goal seeking loop. Here you get a loop that approaches some equilibrium. This is, as it were, the homeostasis. My sort of level of hunger. If my, my hunger gets out of whack, I eat my food, it's brought back into alignment sort of with my, my situation where I don't, I'm not hungry. If my eyes start going, I get a new pair of glasses to improve my vision. Okay? If I have a situation where I have fewer and fewer susceptibles for each new infection, the infection will start to decrease in severity until I have some balanced number of susceptibles in the population. We can also get oscillations of this sort. And we see those oscillations. We showed you earlier, although the shape was a bit different. We see those oscillations in childhood infectious diseases, absent vaccination. We see oscillations in populations associated with uh, uh, you know, uh, ecological um, studies, uh, populations of, of animals. 
these oscillations are caused by negative feedbacks but with a delay. Things are constantly trying to catch up, but they're never fully catching up because of the delay. It's like trying to drive on the road if there were a delay between when you turn and when your wheels respond. You overshoot on one side, then you overshoot on the other, and your car kind of um, zigzags around rather than just you know, hitting the, uh, the straight and narrow. Then we can get a growth and plateau. This is a situation where we have a we have competing loops, positive and negative, and this one limits the growth of that. So we have an initial increase. This is like an exponential increase. Notice early on this looks exponential. Early on, the number of people getting sick in an outbreak looks exponential. It grows very quickly. But eventually, you limit the number of susceptibles, and this is absent recovery. I suppose people, I suppose it's herpes. People don't recover from it. They, they stay infected for their, for their life. These people get infected, they stay infected, but there's fewer and fewer people to affect, and so it goes up to some maximum sort of numbers, this equilibrium, okay? Um, okay, well, we've, we've seen these sort of things. Um, okay, uh, I think, oh man, um, any, well, I could, I could just mention that you gotta be careful when putting together causal loop diagrams. Um, about some things. The diagrams can become very, very large. They can be confusion regarding polarity. Unclear variables is a, is, a major, um, is a major concern that you've got to watch out for and that you can work at. Um, like you don't want a variable on cause of diagram gender because you can't really say more gender or less gender um, or more ethnicity and less ethnicity. Um, uh, you know, you have to ask you know, when you put this into there, does it make sense to say more of it or less of it or a greater amount or a lesser, lesser amount of it? Um, so, you know, we, we, need to, we need to be careful when including these, these things in a diagram. You can get very large diagrams. This is from the uh, Obesity Task Force in, um, in uh, Britain. Um, showing different factors related to the spread of obesity in the population. They kind of grouped it in sectors, with each with sort of a different area that aren't really shown there. Okay, um, I think that's all we have time for uh, on the subject. I've included some additional information on, on sort of caveats of causal diagrams. Uh, we're interested in this. And we're now gonna start to talk about, after our break now, stocks, stocks and flows in a diagram. And we'll use Vensim to start to build simulation models. Okay? A little break, health break, homeostatic restoration. Okay?